so we are very happy today to have uh, Roberta Rudnick. So she is uh, very well known for all her, her work on the, the continental crust, the lithosphere, the origin and evolution of the crust and the mantle. Uh, so she, she made a PhD in uh, ANU. And then, uh, so correct me if I make a mistake, but then held uh, position in uh, Harvard, Maryland University. Now she is professor at the University of California at Santa Barbara. So she had uh, many prizes, many very important papers. I think uh, some of her papers are extremely used on the composition of the crust, for instance. Last year she got the S Medal of the American Geophysical Union, which is very prestigious. And we met exactly 30 years ago in a field trip in uh, Siberia on Kimberlite, I think. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, so I give the room to you. Good morning, everybody. Um, is it, should we put the lights down, do you think? Would it be... Well, thank you uh, for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, it's qu quite a pleasure to visit IPGP. I think the first time I was here was, well, late 80s probably. <laughs> so in, it's changed a lot, including the beautiful new building. Well, it's not new anymore. Anyway, so today I'm going to be talking about crust composition, something I've worked on for most of my career, uh, but focusing on upper continental crust. And I start with this photograph uh, because it nicely encapsulates um, uh, the sort of the work that we're doing. This is a uh, glacially striated Archean uh, bedrock in South Africa, so you can see these these stripes that are going along. That was created about 300 million years ago during uh, the glacial epoch. And superimposed upon this uh, is uh, petroglyphs created by Bushmen uh, that are quite old. And it, this sort of links together early earth, Archean, glacial glaciations, which are going to be part of what I'm talking about today, and, and human evolution. This study that I'm going to tell you about, or it's an ongoing study, and there's been many people involved with it, uh, and here are, are many of the, the players. These are uh, students and postdocs. Uh, I particularly like to acknowledge Rich Gashnig, who was a postdoc with me at the University of Maryland, and he's really the hero of this work. Uh, he did, a, he was participated in all of the field work, um, uh, all of the chemical analyses, the fundamental background analyses of these samples, uh, and some of the initial discoveries that were quite exciting. Uh, also, st graduate students visiting from China, some of my own students, uh, and undergraduate students who have played an essential role in sample preparation, which you'll see uh, was quite extensive in this. So this is the outline of what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, first of all, why do we need a better understanding of upper continental crust composition? One could argue that it is the best known portion of the Earth that we have because we live on it, most accessible. Um, how has the upper continental crust composition been determined in the past? What methods were used? And then I'm going to switch to uh, talking about the work that we're doing, which dates back, the idea dates back to Goldschmidt, which is to use glacial deposits to get an average composition of the exposed Earth surface. And most of the talk will be presenting the results uh, of the study. And some of them I said, well, many of them were unexpected uh, and also quite exciting. OK, so the continental crust is a pretty important reservoir despite the fact that it's a small area of the Earth. On the left here are shown uh, different estimates for the total heat production of the Earth. This is a low heat production model. This is a high heat production model and something in between. And divided uh, amongst these three different pies are how much of the heat is generated in the continental crust. And so the continental crust is in blue, and you can see that uh, at least 
uh, probably a quarter, 25% to maybe almost three quarters of the Earth's heat production today is found in the continental crust. And if we look at the continental crust itself and divide it into different layers, the lower crust, uh, the middle crust, the upper crust, you can see that within the continental crust, these heat producing elements are not evenly distributed. They're concentrated in the upper continental crust due to intracrustal differentiation. And so the upper continental crust becomes a very important reservoir if we're trying to do a mass balance for elements that are incompatible, that is partitioned into melt uh, over the residue. And so that's why it's, a, it's an important thing to study. The other reason we're interested in understanding upper crust composition is because we know that the Earth has evolved as a planet. It may have started out looking something like this with a magma ocean, and over four and a half billion years has evolved to what we see today. And the continents are a prominent part of the Earth. They are unique, as far as we know, within our solar system. And the questions arise that when did continents first appear in Earth history, and, and how were they made? And in particular, um, how did Earth's continental crust evolve over time? Or did it evolve over time? Maybe it just was born and stayed the same since that period. So those are some pretty fundamental questions that we hope to address. So now let's turn to how one goes about obtaining an average composition. And I just put this picture up. It's from the Scottish Highlands. It's just a beautiful representation of upper continental crust. And the problem is, of course, that as you know, uh, it's a very heterogeneous area. It's a very heterogeneous part of the Earth. Every single rock type that we know of exists in the continental crust, in, in the upper continental crust. And so what people have done historically, for example, to determine the major element composition of the upper continental crust, uh, geologists went out to regions like this, which is the Canadian Shield. This is just uh, meant to be illustrative, not uh, actual, but they went out to this region of very well exposed continental crust, exposed, I might add, well because of glaciation, and did grid sampling, and did comp made composite samples of all these grid samples, and then analyzed those composites. And, for example, one of the first studies to do this, Eden Farig in 1973, more than 14,000 grid samples from the Canadian Shield, which they analyzed for major elements and a few trace elements. And I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but I think that probably the rationale for this was because they were probably looking for ore deposits. But anyway, this is, this is where the major element composition of the continental crust and all of the models that exist, this is where this comes from. And similar studies have done, been done more recently in eastern China, uh, in the late 90s, uh, Gao Shan and colleagues uh, did a similar sort of study for eastern China. And that's, pretty, that's, that's the way we get our major element composition. And also uh, soluble trace elements. But there's another way of getting the average composition of the crust that's not so labor intensive. And that is to use nature as a sampling. And in particular, fine-grained sedimentary rocks such as shale and also lurs, which is windblown dust, uh, typically deposited during glacial ep epochs, um, because we, we think that there's been quantitative transport of insoluble elements from the site of weathering into these fine-grained sedimentary rocks. And so instead of going out and trying to, to get a million samples, we can go and get a few samples of shale, and we think that that's giving us some sort of a reasonable average of what's at the Earth's surface and exposed to weathering and erosion. And this is a plot from the Taylor and McLennan book from 1985, and it plots the log of uh, residence time in seawater of an element versus this thing they call the seawater crust partition coefficient. And the main point here is that the elements that are shown in open symbols are very soluble at least uranium today, because it's mostly six plus at the Earth's surface, is a very soluble element. Here's our heat producing elements, potassium and uranium. And then thorium is at the other end of the scale. Thorium is insoluble element, 
like the rare earth elements. And so if we're looking at shales or lurs, this works quite well for these insoluble elements. And here is a rare earth element plot normalized to chondritic meteorites. The top shows various types of shale composites, post archean Australian shale, North American shale composite, European shale, Eastern China, etc. And you can see that they show pretty similar rare earth element patterns. And that gives us some confidence that these, this is a good representation of the upper continental crust worldwide. And then on the, in sort of the purplish color below is, is what Lurs looks like. And it's not a coincidence at all that the upper continental crust rare earth element of everybody's models looks like this because that is where uh, these estimates come from. And if we look again, focusing on the heat producing elements, we can plot lanthanum. So if we have the rare earth elements constrained on the basis of the sediments, then we can look for correlations between the rare earth elements, such as lanthanum, and another element like thorium. And if we have lanthanum concentrations, we can determine the thorium concentration from that, uh, uh, and, and so on. But if we look at potassium and uranium, you see that there's a much greater scatter because these are much more soluble elements and they don't show a, a very good correlation. Consequently, uh, here are our estimates for the upper continental crust from different studies going all the way back to Eden Ferrig in 73 uh, to the most recent compilation from uh, my work with Shan Gao. For potassium and thorium, there's a 25% variation of the various models. For uranium, it's 90% variation. So even though this must be the best known reservoir in the Earth, we still have some uncertainty. Um, so we said, well, what approach can we take that will give us a new look at, at this question? What, what, what can we do that's come at it from a different angle and see uh, if we can pin down the, co the composition and also maybe some uncertainties on that composition. Oops. And so this gets us to Goldschmidt's idea. And I'd like to point out, here is a picture of a smiling Goldschmidt. <laughs> you don't see pictures from that era very often with people smiling, so I like this one in particular. Anyway, so the idea is pretty simple. Glaciers move across the surface of the earth, and as they move across, they pulverize the rock beneath them. And when they melt, they dump that material that they're carrying into these deposits called glacial tills or glacial diamictites are very poorly sorted. And so if we go out and sample these uh, glacial deposits and look particularly at the fine grain matrix of them, May, that was, should give us an average of the portion of the continent that the glacier sampled. This is a picture, of course, from Greenland today, uh, or maybe not today, maybe, maybe it's even less ice now, but, uh, but this gives you an idea of, you know, of, of a continental ice sheet, but back in the ice ages, the extent of ice was probably much greater than what we see in this photo, and so it, sh you know, it should give us some sort of a representation. And by the way, if you, I know it's not the tradition here, but if you'd like to ask questions, if something I say doesn't make sense, please go ahead and, and ask. So glacial diamictites, this is just from the ultimate source, Wikipedia. <laughs> it's just a, it's a poorly sorted sediment. It does not have to be glacial in origin. But there are certain telltale signs, certain indicators that suggest or, or, or basically uh, demonstrate that a particular deposit is glacial in origin. And there's two of these. One is that you can find clasts that have these glacial striations. And so if you find a diamictite with clasts like this, then you can pretty, pretty much be assured that it's glacial in origin. Uh, the other is that there can be some fine grain sediments associated with these glacial deposits. And you can see here this rock, this is from Namibia, um, this is a rock that has seemingly fallen out of the sky. It's into some soft sediment and deformed the sediment. And of course, it's not a meteorite. It did not fall from the sky. So where did it come from? Well, it came from an iceberg that 
calved off of the glacier and traveled out into ocean, melted, and then dropped its load. And so this is called a drop stone. So when there's drop stones, this is considered also a definitive evidence of glaciation, uh, glacial origin. And we, we did not do any of these definitions ourselves. We were relying on previous work uh, to identify diamictites that are glacial in origin. And ju just a note, I will use the term glacial diamictite and tillite interchangeably in this talk. So here are the goals of our project. We were going to analyze the fine grain matrix of these samples and look, and because the Earth has experienced glacial episodes periodically, we can go back through time. And we wanted to refine the composition of the upper continental crust. What did the glacial sa samples tell us? We wanted to put some uncertainties on that composition because whenever you go and look at the literature for an average composition of the crust, including my own, well, actually I've gotten some, un I put some uncertainties in some papers, but mostly you just see a number without a, an uncertainty, which of course we tell our students it's not a number if there's no uncertainty associated with it. Uh, we wanted to see if there's any evidence for temporal changes in the upper crust composition through time. We wanted to investigate what I'm calling here lesser known elements. These are elements often in the P block of the periodic table or in the D block that geochemists didn't traditionally analyze. And we wanted to create an upper crustal reference suite, which we have done because I was a student of Ross Taylor's and he uh, and Scott McLennan create, and others created this, um, these reference materials, post archaean Australian shale. People have been asking me, I inherited some from him, so people ask me, oh, can we get you know, some of this sample because we want to do silicon isotopes or, or what have you. And I've always provided it, but now those, those vials of powder are almost empty, some of them. And so we thought, well, if we're going to go to the trouble of creating these samples, uh, separating the matrix, et cetera, we should make a reference suite that can be available to the community. And so what we've done is made composites of each formation. So there's 24 composite that people can analyze. Well, people can analyze the individual samples too if they wish. So this is the type of rock that we're talking about here. This is an example from the Huronian Supergroup in Ontario very poorly sorted, and it's this fine grain matrix that we were after. And that's where the undergraduate assistants came in, many hours crushing rocks, picking out the matrix from the class, and then pulverizing that to create these samples. And we have lots of samples, over 100 individual samples. And here they're ordered by depositional age. This is a photograph, by the way, of the oldest diamictite, uh, 2.9 billion years, and the Mozan uh, supergroup in the Pongo, uh, sorry, the Mozan group in the Pongolo supergroup in South Africa. And this, this is just a list. Of course, this is the glacial, uh, the Snowball Earth episode in the Neoproterozoic. So there's many, many deposits around the world. This is a very small subset of those. There was another potentially Snowball Earth episode in the Paleoproterozoic. And then there's a few sporadic. Uh, deposits from the Archean, all of the ones that I'm aware of are in South Africa. And so the other thing I wanted to point out is that these, the data that you will see in the subsequent slides is color-coded, and the green is Paleozoic, the red is Neoproterozoic samples, blue is Paleoproterozoic, black is Archean, etc. And at least for some epochs, we have pretty good uh, global coverage. So this is the Snowball Earth uh, Neoproterozoic samples. Here's where our samples come from in a reconstructed, uh, uh, co the continents reconstructed for that time period. In the late Carboniferous, which was a, a Gondwanan glaciation, southern hemisphere, uh, here we have samples from Bolivia and South uh, Africa. So let's first start by looking at some major elements. Well, these are not homogeneous samples, obviously. They're very heterogeneous. This is a plot of silica versus aluminum, two major elements. And here are all the individual samples plotted on this diagram. What you can see is that there's a general trend. Most of the data fall along this line here. 
which is some sort of a mixture between quartz at one end and clay at the other. And then here's, by the way, uh, estimates of average upper continental crust, so it's sort of in the middle. And then there are data that, that sort of fall off this trend uh, orthogonally. And these are due to samples that have preferentially sampled uh, glacial deposits that have preferentially sampled carbonates in some cases. Uh, a lot of the um, Namibian samples uh, are that. Or iron formations. So some of the Paleoproterozoic and Archean samples were sampling iron formation. And so the problem with this is that, um, well, first of all, of course, there's a lot of heterogeneity. And you might think it, at this point it's hopeless. Just give up. <laughs> but of course we didn't. And we turned out that we can see some very nice systematics in the trace element data. And so I'm going to show you some plots throughout this talk. And I want to introduce how these data are being plotted. So this is like a rare earth element diagram in a sense. We have rare, light rare earths shown here. But interspersed are a couple of other elements, and they're plotted in where we would expect them to be in an igneous uh, system. So we would expect molybdenum, for example, to behave similarly to these rare earths, and strontium to behave similarly to these rare earths. The data are first normalized to average upper continental crust. So if they are exactly like what we think the average is, they would plot on a line of one. But we double normalize them, meaning we normalize them a second time because of this quartz and carbonate and ironstone dilution effect. So if you have clays of a given composition, all the clays are similar, but you add a lot of quartz to the sample, then the concentrations are going to go down, or carbonate, or ironstone. So in order to get rid of that, that, that vertical dispersion that's going to be caused by, um, by um, this dilution effect, we double normalize to uh, an, what we think is insoluble elements, such as aluminum or yttrium, which is like a heavy rare earth element, to remove the dilution effects. And that brings, it collapses things together. And so you can see from these examples here, which are all Paleozoic, that the rare earth elements look pretty much like we thought they should do for the upper continental crust. But you'll notice that both molybdenum and strontium are depleted relative to what we expect them to be. And we will quantify these anomalies uh, very much like one calculates a europium anomaly. So we take the strontium observed in the sample, normalized to the upper continental crust, divided by what we expect the strontium to be. So we would interpolate between, in this case, praseodymium and neodymium. So this is what we would expect the strontium to be. And we do a ratio, and it's called strontium, strontium star. And if, it's a, if the strontium is depleted, relative to what we expect, we're going to get a number less than one. And if it's enriched, we would get a number greater than one. So I'm going to use that sort of notation to quantify the anomalies that we see in trace elements. And right, right off the bat, you can see that all of these samples are depleted in strontium and also molybdenum uh, relative to the rare earth elements. Well, the strontium depletion in particular is a sign of chemical weathering. Now, one of the main reasons for going to glacial deposits is because it's a physical erosion process. And we expected the influence of chemical weathering to be very minimal. We didn't expect to see a big chemical weathering signature. But right off the bat, you can see that, well, maybe our expectations were not correct. And so we can quantify chemical weathering using the chemical index of alteration, which is simply a ratio of an insoluble element like your aluminum over itself plus these elements that we expect to be more soluble. And unweathered igneous rocks should plot at lower C, uh, CIA values at, say, 55 or lower, maybe even less than 55. And if you weather a rock, then the CIA index goes up. And this is what we would see, for example, Precambrian shales. This is what Lurs looks like. And these are data from the literature before we started this work. And we could see that there was some indication that maybe the 
the glacial deposits were slightly less weathered than Lurse and, um, and shales. Uh, for some reason, the Neoproterozoic seemed to sort of stand out as being more weathered, but if we eliminated those, we'd see a relatively unweathered signature, and then we can get these insoluble elements, sorry, yeah, the soluble elements, like uranium and potassium, pinned down in the upper crust. Well, that was our expectation. The reality was completely different, <laughs> which is how you learn something in science, right? <laughs> you go in with an idea, and you test it, and then you find out you're completely wrong, but then you learn something. So these are the CIA index of our samples now, and this is the peak from Lurse, and this is the peak from Shale, and these are color-coded, and what you can see is that almost all of them show a chemical weathering signature, and the Neoproterozoic are not the most weathered. The Archaeans seem to be the most weathered, and the Paleoproterozoic are here, and the, and the Phanerozoic are here, and so um, that was a surprise, and we can conclude that they all, many of them have high chemical index of alteration, especially the oldest samples. So then we had to say, well, where did this weathering signature come from? Now, there's three possibilities, and they are not mutually exclusive. It could be that the deposits, the glaciers dumped their load, and then they were weathered post-depositional. There might be some chemical weathering going on at the time of glaciation, or maybe the glaciers are sampling weathered regolith. And we spent some time trying to distinguish between these three to see if all of them were equally likely or one was more likely than the other. And I'm not going to go into all of the arguments, but I'd like to show this uh, sample here. This is a drill core, so many of our samples are from drill cores from South Africa. Uh, these were obtained by various mining companies, and we were able to access them thanks to Nick Bucus. Here's the base of this particular formation, which is Deutschland, which is deposited around 2.3 billion years ago. You go up section, and then here's the top. And I'm showing this because, and then immediately there's shales on top of it. Now, there's no evidence of a soil profile developed in this one. And most of them are like this because most of them are glacial marine, meaning the glaciers scraped off the continents, went out into the ocean, melted in the ocean, dumped their load in the, in the marine environment, and then had sediments on top of them. So we saw very little evidence for post-depositional weathering in these deposits. And we think that the main source of this weathering signature is what the glaciers were sampling. That is, they were sampling a pretty weathered uh, or surface of the earth, which may not be too surprising. But the reason it was surprising to us is that if you think about the last episode of Pleistocene glaciation, you are scraping off bedrock because there's been this cycle, this Milankovitch cycle that's produced uh, cyclic glaciations. And so, so that leads to a couple of interesting questions which we don't have the answer to, but one is that uh, why is it that and I, don't, I have data for Pleistocene deposits, and they are relatively unweathered. So this last lobe of, glacier, uh, lobe of glaciers that came off of the North American cratons deposited a relatively unweathered sample uh, because they were scraping off material that had already been scraped off. And so in the past, though, all of the samples are highly weathered. They all have this weathering signature. So it implies that we know that we had periodic glaciations, for example, in the Neo-Proterozoic, but it implies that we did not have a Milankovitch-type cycle, and that there was enough time between the advance of these glaciers to create a pretty weathered uh, surface, and that's what they were sampling. And the other important question is, well, we know that the upper crust has to have an inherent weathering signature, and how deep in the crust does that signature go? And, and uh, I'm not going to address that, but um, that's a good question. So now, I'd like to turn to the question of, uh, do we see evidence for a changing composition of the crust? Here is the same type of diagram I showed you previously, except now we are looking at the heavy rare earths, and attached to those are some transition metals. These are elements that are in, typically enriched in more mafic samples and depleted in more felsic samples. 
And here are averages of the different deposits. And you can see that there is a systematic change with depositional age. So all of them have fairly similar heavy rare earth elements. But then when you get into these transition metals, you see that the Archean and Paleoproterozoic, the black and the blue here, are relatively high. And the green and the red are low. The younger samples are depleted in these elements. And those with, with a, an eye for detail would notice, oh, wait a minute, there's this one Paleozoic sample here sitting up in the blue area. But it turns out that that Western Dwika sample, which is from South Africa, has a protolith that was all Archean. And we know this from detrital zircons in the sample. So even though it was deposited in the, at 300 million years ago, it was sampling Archean crust. The glaciers were, were traversing the Kopval craton. And so we see clear evidence in these data for a change from a more mafic bulk composition systematically to a more uh, evolved granitic type bulk composition. Well, this was not really anything new because people studying shales had noted this many uh, years back, all the way back to Eden Farrig. When you compare uh, the rare earth elements, for example, in shales, and uh, it's been attributed to the presence of commodiite in our key and upper continental crust. And these are some plots from Condi's 1993 classic paper about the upper continental crust. And this just shows, it's a little hard to see, but it's like what the, the picture Rick showed the other day shows you the change in computer graphics <laughs> with time. But anyway, you can see that it's the younger samples that have high lanthanum scandium and high thorium scandium uh, relative to the older samples, which are more mafic overall. So this is nothing new, but it gave us some confidence that we're actually seeing systematic changes with these data. But however, if we go back to this plot now and focus in on some of the details, I want to point out that there is some interesting enrichments here in vanadium in the older samples and depletions in the younger samples. The same thing is true for chromium, is enriched in the older and depleted in the younger. And if we look at nickel cobalt, here's nickel, here's cobalt, you can see that this ratio changes systematically from being high to being flat in the Paleoproterozoic to being low in the younger samples. Now, these sorts of changes can be due to a couple of different things. One is that it could reflect igneous differentiation of the crust. So we might expect, for example, nickel cobalt to change systematically with differentiation, and we're simply seeing an evolved crust composition from mafic to felsic. Or in some of these some of these elements, like chromium and vanadium, have multiple valence states, and they would be sensitive to oxidative weathering. And so it might be that we're seeing the, the rise of atmospheric oxygen and the influence of, of the advent of oxidative weathering on these compositions. So, so we have to ask this question, are these systematics, and they're very systematic, due to this enhanced intercrustal differentiation or something else like weathering? We can, we can uh, address that by, I'm going to use this normalized nickel concentration. You see it's a, quite a very broad range. I'm going to use that as a proxy for how differentiated the crust is. So if it's got a high normalized nickel, it's relatively undifferentiated, relatively mafic. And if it's low, it's much more felsic. Okay, so here's a plot of that nickel normalized versus nickel cobalt versus chrome, chrome star, the degree of chromium depletion or enrichment. And you can see a pretty good trend here with nickel cobalt. And of course, nickel and cobalt are not multivalent. They're all two plus. And so this is clearly an igneous differentiation trend. More mafic crust, more felsic crust. And chrome, chrome star looks to be the same. Even though chromium can be six plus and soluble, we don't see that oxidative weathering is having any influence, that we see this igneous differentiation. So we think that this decrease in nickel cobalt and the, and, and chrome chrome star is due to enhanced crustal differentiation with time. 
But if we look at other elements, like here's vanadium, vanadium star versus nickel, there's a very poor correlation here. And here's the same thing, molybdenum, molybdenum star, that was, molybdenum's more like a light rare earth. I showed you on those first plots. There's virtually no correlation here. And so we cannot attribute these variations, these systematic variations in molybdenum depletion and chromium de enrichment or depletion, we cannot attribute that, uh, sorry, vanadium, we cannot attribute that to igneous differentiation. So we think that what we're seeing here is the advent of oxidative weathering. So we think that these variations are due to the advent of oxidative weathering. So this is just a list of some transition metals, and in red you are the, where, where we have a, an element with multiple valence states, the red are the soluble ones. So vanadium becomes soluble in its oxidized form. Same thing for chromium, same thing for molybdenum, same thing for uranium, which I haven't shown you yet. So let's look at molybdenum. Here's now the whole suite of elements, this, this one I showed you earlier, we call these W plots because they look like a W, in, at least in the younger samples. Now all of them, almost all of them are systematically depleted in strontium, irrespective of their age. That's the weathering signature. And strontium is only two plus, it doesn't care about oxygen, and so it's just telling us that we're sampling weathered materials. But molybdenum, is, does depend upon oxygen. And when we have no oxygen in the atmosphere, molybdenum is primarily in four plus state, it's insoluble. And so if we look at the Archean samples, we don't see any evidence for molybdenum depletion. So they're weathered, they're strongly weathered, their CIA is high, but they were weathered in the absence of oxygen. And then if we go to the Paleoproterozoic, well there's one, there's one sample from uh, formation from Wyoming that doesn't show any weathering signature, so we can't use it to say anything about oxygen. But if we look at the Paleoproterozoic samples, we see a change from no molybdenum depletion to systematic molybdenum depletion, and we think this is the, the um, appearance of atmospheric oxygen. And during the Paleoproterozoic is the time when we had the great oxidation event. And so we begin to see molybdenum being systematically stripped from the continents due to weathering. And of course we've known this because people use molybdenum in black shales as a proxy for oxygen. And people looking at the black shales see that concentrations are very low until the GOE when they go up a little bit. And then especially in the neoproterozoic, they go up very significantly. So, that was pretty interesting because we did not expect to see this, but we could see the rise of atmospheric oxygen in the chemical signature of these glacial deposits. And here's a, a plot, cross plots of the molybdenum, molybdenum star versus vanadium, vanadium star. And here's thorium uranium. So uranium becomes soluble in a six plus state. And you can see that the black and the blue are in one quadrant, generally speaking. The red and the green are in another quadrant and for both of these plots. So this would be weathered in an anoxic environment. These would be weathered in an oxygen-rich environment. Oh well, I don't know how rich, just at least enough oxygen to create these more oxidized versions of the elements. So we can see the onset of oxidative weathering. Most paleoproterozoic tillites show no evidence of oxidative weathering. And there's one, though, that's called Deutschland, which I've highlighted here with larger symbols, and I've outlined it here. This is Paleoproterozoic, and it was originally thought to be pre-GOE, that it formed before the onset of ox oxygen, or the rise of oxygen. And yet, it looks strongly oxidatively weathered, and if I did not know the age of this sample, and just looked at the data, I'd say, well, it's neoproterozoic. It says the neoproterozoic have this particularly oxidative weathered signature where we actually see uranium being depleted. But it's not. So let's talk a little bit about the GOE. These days, it's defined on the appearance 
of mass independent fractionation of sulfur isotopes. Now you have Pierre Cartigny here, and I know he's been involved with some of this work, so you may have heard about this in the past, but uh, this is work that was discovered, or a phenomenon that was discovered by my former colleague James Farquhar, who's at the University of Maryland. And what he discovered is that this capital delta 33 sulfur is a measure of how close the isotopic fractionation is to being totally mass dependent. So if it's totally mass dependent, it would plot here at zero. But if there's mass independent fractionation going on, then you plot off of the zero line. And what you can see, this remarkable result, is that it's zero until, these are just sulfur samples of sulfides and sulfates, it's zero until around 2.3 to 2.4, and then you get huge not, uh, mass independent fractionation effects. Um, and this has been attributed to the rise of atmospheric oxygen, because the, re the way these uh, mass independent fractionation are produced is through the through interaction of ultraviolet radiation with sulfur species. Now today, much of the ultraviolet radiation is not hitting the Earth's surface because we have an ozone layer. But we don't have an ozone layer unless there's atmospheric oxygen. It doesn't take much. Uh, Pavlov and Casting calculated you only need 20 parts per million oxygen in the atmosphere to essentially cut off most of the UV flux to the surface, and so that is what we define as the GOE today. It's this change from mass independent fractionation to zero mass independent fractionation. Now the Deutschland sample is this one right here. So it's been analyzed and you can see that it's not zero. And that's why people thought it must be pre-GOE. But our data says there's no way it's pre-GOE. It has to be, have formed because of this weathering signature, a very oxidized uh, weathering situation. And so what we think is going on here is that uh, there's a smearing out of the of this signal by, because sediments are inherent, inherently cannibalistic and most sediments are sampling previous sediments. And so if in the Paleozoic you have a sample deposited that is sampling Archean sediments that formed in the, op in the absence of oxygen, then you might expect to see this MIF signal. And, and so we think that this might be um, this um, recycling, basically, of the MIF. And this was already suggested by Reinhardt et al., and we think that this is evidence for that. Now we have some other data that, that show this rise of atmospheric oxygen. One of them are, is molybdenum isotope data. And these are some uh, yet unpublished data from my student, Al Greeny. And this is uh, delta 98 molybdenum versus time for these glacial deposits. And the symbols are pre-GOE, uh, syn-GOE, that is about the time of oxygen uh, the for, uh, rise in the atmosphere, and then post-GOE. And you can see that there's a pretty good correlation with time. All of the Archean samples have isotopic compositions that are like unweathered continental crust, upper continental crust. And then you start to see them going a little negative in the Paleoproterozoic, except the Deutschland formation is way down here. Again, this is the one that shows very strong oxidative weathering signature. It's uranium depleted, and it looks like a uh, neoproterozoic sample, but it's clearly paleoproterozoic. So the isotopic fractionation that's going on here is that when you develop uh, iron manganese oxides in an oxidized weathering environment, they are isotopically light. And so they take in, uh, they, they have a, a, a lower delta 98 molybdenum. Uh, the water would be in the opposite direction. Water is up here. And so what we see, again, with the molybdenum isotopes is the rise of atmospheric oxygen, with Deutschland being exceptional. And we're wondering if that might mean that we can put some constraints on how much oxygen might have been present to create this very oxidized sign signature for the Deutschland. Because it's still an unsettled question how much oxygen was there after the GOE. It had to be 20 parts per million, but that's very low. 
And it, was it 20% like we have today, or was it, did it go up and then down again? These are all big questions. So uh, what our tillites are telling us is we see the onset of oxidative weathering. We recorded in these multivalent transition metals like vanadium and molybdenum and uranium. Uh, most of these show no evidence of the paleoproterozoic for oxidative weathering, including post-GOE samples because they're sampling sediments that formed in the absence of oxygen by recycling. Um, the exception is the Deutschland formation. Now, um, in, the, in the remaining time I have left, I want to return to this question about crustal evolution uh, and how did Earth's continental crust evolve over time. So Ming Tong was a PhD student of mine. Uh, he was not working on the diamictites, but he'd sit in on our group meetings and he got interested in this question. And so he independently went to the literature and looked at shale data. And you can see, here's nickel cobalt that we saw earlier. It, it changes systematically with magnesium. So that's what's shown here is an is igneous differentiation trend. These are igneous rocks. And you can see that um, average post-Archean sediments have a low nickel cobalt. And the Archean sediments, and this is shale or uh, diamictites, have a high. And a similar ratio that behaves similarly is chrome zinc that he discovered. And we see this fundamental change. And he realized that we can use this, perhaps, to determine independently the average MGO content of the upper continental crust. Magnesium is highly soluble. We can't just go out and measure the sediments and say, oh, that's what the magnesium concentration was. But if we can use these insoluble trace element ratios to, as a proxy, then we can get a handle on the average magnesium. So here is a plot of the sedimentary data, shales and diamictites, as a function of depositional age for these two ratios. You can see it changing very systematically. The average comes down, and most of the action is occurring in the Archean between uh, 3.5 and 2.5 is when we get this fundamental change for both of these ratios. And this is not uh, something due to just you know some provenance effect that we because the diamictites, of course, are all the, of this age are mostly South African. But he went through and looked at shales from all of the different continents, and we can see these trends irrespective of where we are in the world. So it's not just that we're sampling some unusual crust in South Africa. So he said, well, we can take uh, igneous rocks and we can do a Monte Carlo simulation, just uh, random sampling of igneous rocks and get a, a population that looks something like this. And then if we use the nickel cobalt or chromium zinc ratio from the sediments, we can infer MGO content from that. And that's what he did. And he came up with this rather astounding observation here is the blue is the average MGO content, and that's, here's the scale bar here. So it went from something like 15 weight percent on average down to what's more like typical upper crustal values today during this time period from 3.3 uh, .3 to 2.5 uh, billion years ago. And so I couldn't believe this when he did when he showed this to me. I knew he had to be wrong. There was something that was wrong about this approach, but I could not figure out what that was. And and I think that this is real. Although if I were to redo it today, instead of using an average, I, because these are skewed populations, I'd probably go for a median, and that would that would. Uh, dampen this effect a little bit. The magnesium concentrations wouldn't be quite so high. But it says that there was this fundamental change in the bulk composition of the upper continental crust. And in a simple-minded way, we said, well, what's the easiest way to change the MGO content? Well, we start with a lot of basalt and commodiite, maybe a little bit of granite, and we add granite to it. And, the, and the, the most productive way of producing granites today is through subduction and plate tectonics. And so the idea was that maybe this change represents the onset of plate tectonics, because that's a good way of making granites. So that was a story that was published a couple years back in science. And then since then, 
Um, you probably you saw if you came to um, Zheng Bin's thesis defense yesterday, you saw plots like this. There's a, a titanium isotopes as a proxy for bulk silica content. So here's an igneous differentiation trend, and the idea is titanium should be insoluble, so you can go out and measure it in shales, and you can use that to infer silica as a function of time. And this was work that was published just last fall in science by Graeber et al. Uh, out of Dofaz lab at University of Chicago, and here are their data for shales. The size of the symbol represents the number of shales that are averaged, and so you can see that they see no trend in titanium isotopes as a function of time. And they said, therefore, there's been no change in crust composition. It's been relatively felsic because if you take this value, it's like 0.15, which on the scale would take you up to about 63 weight percent silica. So it's not changed over time. You can see there's a lot of scatter in these data. There's some, some data points that are sort of obscured by the labeling here. So there's a huge amount of scatter, which, you know, I, I I'm concerned about that. I'm not sure why there should be so much scatter. But, it, but anyway, if you use this proxy as they did, uh, this is how silica content changes. They also see a fairly significant magnesium change, similar to what Ming Tang inferred from the shales. But they say silica really hasn't changed much. Well, then, um, most recently, Fong Huang and his students at USTC in China have produced vanadium isotope data for the diamictites. And here is a plot of vanadium isotopes in the diamictites. Vanadium behaves very similarly to titanium. It fractionates not due to chemical weathering. This has been established by looking at weathering profiles and seeing no change in vanadium uh, isotopes, but due to igneous fractionation. But we see a pretty good trend in the diamictite data. And if you put silica values on those, we would infer that the change is from about 50 weight percent silica uh, in the Archean deposits to something like 64 weight percent silica in the most in the Phanerozoic deposits. So we get two different answers from these two different stable isotope uh, uh, proxies. So here's what the vanadium tells us, superimposed upon the Graeber et al. inference from titanium. Well, if you followed Zhenbing's work, you know that it, the titanium isotopes may not be the full story because there are different uh, fractionation trends depending upon whether you're looking at a calc alkaline differentiation suite, which is what Graeber et al. looked at, or a tholeitic suite. And I was happy to see Jengbin's results because if you use his tholeitic trend for the titanium isotopes, and in first silica value, you see a change that's much more similar to the vanadium isotope results. So this is all a big question. There's a lot of debate about it currently. Uh, but I think it's really interesting. And um, I think that eventually, as we get more in data, as we understand these isotope systems more, uh, more thoroughly, will be able to say what, you know, which of these is correct or if any of them are correct. <laughs> so this, this is the state of the art currently. So what's next? Uh, obviously, titanium isotope data for the diamictites. This is actually in progress as I speak. There's some preliminary data that was sent to me by my uh, collaborators here. And the titanium isotopes do show a change with time in the diamictites. Now remember, the diamictites are fundamentally unsorted sediments. So it leads me to wonder whether the, the very large scatter that's seen in the shale data might be due to something like uh, mineral sorting, because different heavy minerals that contain titanium would have a is different isotopic composition, perhaps. Uh, calibrating the vanadium isotopes for igneous rocks is also work that's in progress by Fong Wang and others. Um, and then, of course, we'd like to try to reconcile these different results. So, some conclusions. Um, one thing we can say is that the upper crustal strontium is almost certainly too high because we have this weathering signature. Uh, we don't know how deep it goes in the upper crust, however. Multivalent transition metals um, record the rise of oxidative weathering, and that mostly postdates the GOE. Uh, well, it, it does post-date the GOE. I would argue that Deutschland is post-GOE, 
uh, and it's strongly oxidatively weathering, weathered. Uh, average magnesium in the upper continental crust was very high. Uh, just how high we can debate, but there's no question there was a change in the magnesium concentration. And that may reflect the onset of widespread plate tectonics. And then I'm, I just want to end with two other slides that show you the sort of stuff, the sort of work that's been going on on these diamictite deposits. Um, it's like you have the whole periodic table at your disposal, and most of the elements in the periodic table have more than one isotope. So these are the, this is the work that's been published so far uh, on these diamectites, and these are this is the um, the work that's being undertaken. Uh, so again, so some of these are concentrations or zircon dating, but then just about every uh, element that has an more than one isotope is being analyzed on these samples, but if there's something up here that's not represented and you're interested in doing it, um, certainly let, let me know because we have the samples. So thank you for your attention. I'm glad you have a microphone because I find the acoustics in this room are very hard to, it's hard to hear. <laughs> Uh-oh, it may not work. Okay. My question is very simple. You, you seem to be surprised to find a weathered uh, signature in the continental crust, but as you said, I mean, erosion, at least modern erosion, is cannibalistic. So we always uh, rework ancient sedimentary rocks. And so how do you distinguish between the upper continental crust and this continuously recycled mass of sediments at the surface of the Earth? Doesn't, doesn't it explain your strontium anomaly or the molybdenum anomalies also that you find? The, the difference between um, soils and the stuff that's beneath them, or, or sediments and the stuff that's beneath them. Sedimentary rocks. Sorry? Sed sedimentary rocks. Sedimentary rocks. Okay, yeah. which are part of the upper Yeah, 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 I agree. So the question is, why were we surprised? <laughs> and I, I ask that my, to myself all the time. <laughs> we shouldn't have been surprised, but I was surprised because I had this image in my mind of the Canadian Shield, which is pretty much, you know, very little regolith. And, if, and the glaciers that came down, you know, in the, the, last, the last Pleistocene glaciers that came down were sampling bedrock that was pretty much unweathered. And we see that in, in the, the chemistry of those sediments. So, so it's not, it shouldn't have been a surprise, but it was because we wouldn't think it through far enough. <laughs> Does that answer? No. <laughs> but the question of how deep does this signal go? So Francis Alberide years ago, in fact, said, well, there's a, you know, he's, he's one of the advocates that says the reason the continental crust is not basalt is because of chemical weathering. Because the elements like magnesium are soluble and calcium is soluble and you lose them due to chemical weathering and that's why we have a non-basaltic crust composition, which I was very skeptical of initially, but I think that the weathering signature, there, there's evidence that there is a weathering signature through most of the crust, even the crystalline rocks, because if you look at oxygen isotopes, for example, it's really hard to find samples that are mantle-like in their oxygen isotope composition. And if we think that oxygen isotopes are fractionated primarily by chemical weathering, that suggests that this weathering signature, probably in the form of sediments, has been incorporated very deep into the crust. But uh, I would bet a lot that we don't see the degree of strontium depletion uh, you know, going down very deep into the crust, that if you get into the lower crust, middle crust, you would not see that signature. It's, it's a surface feature. Okay, more questions, comments? Uh, thank you. Um, since you see uh, more mafic uh, uh, samples in the Archean. Do you know why there is no evolution of the 
incompatible elements? Do I, sorry? Do you know why is there no evolution of the incompatible elements in oh, your time do we series? See an, do we see a change in the incompatible elements? Yeah. Uh, we do, it's much more subtle than for the compatible elements. And that's probably, so, so this gets back to another thing, you know, if you look at uh, elements that are indicative of mafic and ultramafic rocks like nickel and cobalt, they're going to be preferentially influenced by mafic and ultramafic rocks. If you look at light rare earth elements, they're going to be preferentially influenced by uh, granites. And so either one of them is giving us an incomplete picture, really, uh, about what the crust is because of this mass balance pro uh, problem. So looking at um, uh, the rare earth elements in shales, for example, um, those are going to be dominated by whatever granitic component exists, even if that granitic component is only 15% of the surface area of the crust, because the granitic component has very high concentrations, especially the types of granites that were in the Archean, the tonalite, trongemite, granodiorites, compared to uh, greenstone belt basalts or commodiites. And so that's a problem. So, so, they're, so they're, they're fundamentally sensitive to different uh, bulk compositions. So that's why I think that the sable isotopes have great hope in, in unraveling this, uh, you know, um, because they should give us a, you know, if we can figure out what the signal is and figure out what igneous differentiation trend we should be using, they could give us a, a, a more balanced picture of what's going on, I think. Uh, I have a short question about chromium. Uh, you say that chromium uh, follows differentiation, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I thought that chromium, uh, the oxidized form of chromium was mobile. You're correct. And, and uh, isotopes from Fry and Planovsky and yep. showed that uh, it was mobile. So uh, yep. do you have any explanation? I think I do. Uh, so I think these, these multivalent transition elements are, uh, have different degrees of sensitivity to the PO2. So you might need more oxygen to create chromium 6 plus, for example, than you do to make uh, molybdenum 6 plus. And so my sense from working on these samples is that molybdenum is very easy to oxidize. You don't need much oxygen to create molybdenum 6 plus. Uh, uranium is sort of intermediate. You need more oxygen, partial pressure of oxygen, to create uranium 6 plus relative to 4 plus and mobilize uranium. And chromium is at the other end of the spectrum. You need extremely oxidized conditions to create chromium 6 plus, And we don't see that in these samples. So, I, so our chromium data, at first we thought we were looking at oxidative weathering, but then we realized that all of the variation in the chromium can be uh, explained just by igneous differentiation. We see a pretty good trend with differentiation. We don't need to call upon oxidative weathering. So we don't think there was ever enough oxygen present in any, for any of these samples, even in the Neoproterozoic, to create significant chromium 6 plus. And there are unpublished chromium isotope data uh, that Rich Gashnig and Noah Planavsky and Chris Reinhardt obtained, and we don't see any change in the chromium through time, which would sort of support that. Okay, fair enough. More questions? Comments? Yeah, sure. Okay, so um, my question is relative to the um, GEO and the Deutschland sample, and you said that, um, well, the deposits, well, the alteration signal that you can find in the deposits comes from the uh, already weathered bedrock, but would it be possible for that sample that it was altered after it was deposited? Post-depositional? Yeah. Well, that's why I showed you that photograph of the drill core. That was Deutschland. Okay. Okay. And, <laughs> and I specifically chose that one because we see this very intense oxidative weathering signature in it. Uh, it's supposed to be pre-GOE, but we don't see any evidence of a regolith being formed on, at, the, at the top of that deposit. We've done also lithium isotopes through these because lithium is fairly sensitive to chemical weathering, and it's just 
it's sort of straight. It just doesn't change with depth like we would expect in a, a weathering profile. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I think earlier on you were mentioning that uh, molybdenum, molybdenum star and vanadium vanadium star were sort of the indicators for oxidative weathering. Is that right? Yes. And the vanadium star, or well, the vanadium isotopes show that it's more of a proxy of silicon yes. differentiation. Yes. Yes. And I, I saw that the sort of the vanadium isotopes and the molybdenum isotopes they vary in the opposite directions. Yes. Um, so can you rule out the magmatic differentiation effect from molybdenum, and have you tried plotting the molybdenum isotopes versus the molybdenum molybdenum star? Um, let me think about that for a second. Molybdenum isotopes, I'm trying to remember. So people have suggested that molybdenum isotopes may change during differentiation. Um, and I can't remember, though, whether they get heavier or lighter. I, I, uh, but I think I th because we see, you know, just looking at the molybdenum elemental uh, composition. We, I think it's the, I think it's the opposite, but I, you know, I wouldn't, would, don't hold me to that. <laughs> so I think the, for molybdenum, it doesn't, it, you cannot explain it through igneous differentiation. For vanadium, so this was my first expectation with the vanadium isotopes, because we see vanadium being depleted due to oxidative weathering. I thought, oh well, the isotopes will reflect that, except that apparently vanadium isotopes don't fractionate during chemical weathering. So Fang Huang, again, uh, has done these profiles through uh, saprolites and, and I don't, well, saprolites for sure, maybe bauxites, weathering profiles, and sees just constant vanadium isotopic composition irrespective of the degree of weathering. So I think we can be confident that the change in the isotopes that we're seeing is due to differentiation and not due to chemical weathering. But the concentrations are being influenced by chemical weathering, I would argue. Yeah. Thank you. More questions? Comments? Catherine? Yes, Catherine. Very nice talk, Roberta. Uh, I have a question about, uh, it's kind of more general, it's about uh, the use of the GeroG database to look at what happened yeah. uh, far away in the I've past. I've heard this question before from somebody. Oh, <laughs> not me. Al. <laughs> oh, yeah. He always says, oh, <laughs> you're using GeoRock. <laughs> yeah, so, but anyway, I want to ask the question. Because, uh, you know, I've been uh, using the GeroG database as well to look at Ocean Island results present day, and there is a very strong bias of what is analyzed depending on you know, fashion, depending of how an island is easy to reach and so on. So it's a strongly biased and it's, we tend to use it without having this critical view. And uh, so I was wondering how much that could apply to the Archean uh, data that are in, G in GeoRock because, you know, people, everybody wants to, to measure comatiites and there's a lot of public, published data on that. So I'm just wondering, maybe we should be a little careful and uh, maybe it's worth looking at a little more carefully from that point well, of view. Um, so that's po quite a possibility, I would say. Um, but I would argue that it's the shales that we're using to get the ma magnesium concentration. And we're just assuming that whatever is in GeoRock must be some way representative. Of course, if it's completely unrepresentative, then then it's a mess for us. But it's the shales that we're using and the nickel cobalt and the chromium zinc in the shales to say, to infer what the average magnesium concentration might have been. But again, I, if I were to redo it today, I wouldn't use average, I'd use median. Uh, and that will, that will bring the magnesium concentrations down uh, because they're being influenced, skewed to very high values due to some samples that have a lot of chromatiite in them. Most well, certainly. Okay, any more questions, comments? If not, let's thanks Roberta Rodini once again. Thanks. Thanks for the questions.